Okay, good evening, everybody. Here, let me pull my microphone within six feet of me. All right, good evening, everybody. Welcome back to the Mythgard Academy. This is our class on the War of the Ring, session number 10 <clears throat> on the War of the Ring. And having fallen behind last time, I have a hugely ambitious plan to get caught up this time, <laughs> which is off to a roaring start uh, since I'm late. But... Uh, Someday, okay, I was about to say someday, you know, like my kids aren't going to always like ask for stuff right before class and then I'll be on time. But really what it means is that I won't have my kids to blame anymore, anymore I suppose. <clears throat> anyway, here we are. Welcome back, everybody. Uh, so I just wanted to uh, first uh, start off with uh, just uh, announcing a few things. Uh, we've got a bunch of things coming up I wanted to show you. I showed this on Exploring the Lord of the Rings last night, but it's worth looking at again. This is the events page uh, for signumuniversity.org, uh, where you can see all of our upcoming stuff, our upcoming moots. We've got Myth Moot here in June. We've got Bay Moot uh, in Northern California there, at, uh, being hosted at Mills College in Oakland, California. California uh, in August, August 18th. So those are two upcoming events. Of course, Myth Moot is coming up soon. Uh, registration for Myth Moot goes through the end of May. So that is getting uh, getting right up to the to the moment now. Uh, we've got a great crowd of people coming. Really hope uh, that uh, more people can make it. Um, it is such a wonderful time, uh, and uh, you know you, I know that you will uh, you'll have a great time uh, if you're able to come to Mythmoot. And I always look forward to the opportunity to uh, get to spend some time with folks there. Um, the schedule is up for those of you who are uh, uh, have been looking for that, so you can see the uh, the schedule there in uh, on that page and uh, uh, lots of information there. Um, the other thing, of course, we can see on this page are uh, other activities such as our Mythgard Movie Club, the next one coming up in uh, next month in June. They just had one down here. Yeah, Alien just happened. A discussion on Alien. You can catch it on YouTube if you didn't catch it. Um, and uh, uh, they're uh, they're going to do one on the new on the new solo movie. Um, there's our Signum Symposia, We've got our thesis theater. You can check out, uh, uh, you know, hear some more about the, the really cool research being done by our Signum master students. Um, this one I wanted to especially highlight here. Uh, on May 24th, we're doing a very special uh, live uh, panel discussion featuring uh, the, uh, uh, the 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 the. The ineffable Tom Shippey, uh, who is going to be talking about his new book. So his new book is being released, Laughing, I Sh Laughing Shall I Die, Lives and Deaths of the Great Vikings, um, uh, which is a wonderful opportunity to hear about his new research here. And uh, you should definitely, you know, catch out his book uh, if you can. Um, Tom Shippey, you know, I think most of you know Tom Shippey and how awesome Tom Shippey is. Uh, but uh, if you don't, you absolutely should check it out. And, I, I, you know, I promise that uh, his uh, both his book and this uh, this session are going to be uh, are going to be really awesome. So uh, that's May twenty fourth at two p.m. Eastern time. Uh, and the last thing I wanted to draw your attention to, uh, we, you know, we, we have we do a whole bunch of different sort of uh, uh, you know open events. One that's coming up soon here on May seventeenth, uh, a, a sort of a practical uh, uh, discussion on how to present at conferences. Especially, you know, with this group here in the Mythgard Academy, I have often uh, uh, sort of prodded and poked at you, uh, at, you know, at, at, at several of you on several occasions. Uh, to submit paper topics and stuff when you guys raise really interesting questions which, uh, you know, sort of lead to big discussions that we don't have time for and I've said, well, that sounds like a really great topic for a Myth Moot paper. Um, and obviously, with the increase now in our regional Moot program, you know, there's, there's just way more opportunities now for people to, to present ideas and uh, and uh, uh, and uh, present at our, at our, either our mini conferences or at Myth Moot. Um, anyway, so... Uh, but a lot of people feel like, you know, don't have much experience with that or feel kind of worried about it. Or sometimes maybe you're not inexperienced. You know, maybe you're uh, maybe you're a graduate student or uh, or a, a, a faculty member 
in English and you present at conferences and it's something that you kind of have to do routinely, but it's never been something you've really enjoyed doing or you're not really comfortable with it and would like to, uh, to sort of get some, some really good tips on how to be a, a better and more effective presenter at conferences. Uh, this is going to be a really useful uh, symposium event here, um, May 17th. So certainly anybody who's going to be presenting at Mythmoot this year or again thinking about presenting at our upcoming conferences, I, uh, I strongly... Uh, I strongly encourage you to uh, to check that out. So uh, anyway, okay, so lots of stuff going on and the our events page, you can see all the things, you know, up to the next few months uh, that are coming up. So this is a great way to keep track of everything that's happening uh, here at Signum, or at least most of the things, you know, all of our, uh, all of these uh, public events that we're, that we're organizing as well as our conferences and everything else. So really cool stuff. So anyway, all right. Let us get back to our text. So we got through Carathungal. And now we are shifting back to Gondor. We are looking at the last book, right? Book five. Because there are obviously only going to be five books in The Lord of the Rings. I mean, that's very clear, right? Um, uh, Tolkien is very determined about that. So, um, uh, so yeah. So, so we're, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to, pick that up and get through as much as we can. I've titled this class Loose Ends and Perplexities. You may remember uh, in the preface um, to the uh, 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 to the second edition of the Fellowship of the Ring, um, when he sort of talks about the experience of writing and, uh, the and, you know, sort of for the first time publicly shoots down the, you know, World War II allegory reading and all that kind of thing. Um, when he's giving his sort of account of writing um, the book, he talks about leaving the loose ends and perplexities, you know, of a war which it was, you know, uh, his duty to to uh, to conduct or at least to report. Um, and we can see here him wrestling with loose ends and perplexities. Um, I think that the way that we can see uh, the story developing and the ideas kind of forming uh, in this chapter are really cool. Um, this is, I find, you know, we're looking at this with the Kirith Ungold chapter last time, and we can see, you know, some of those same things, but but again, here even more, like we get more and more iterations, and I want to look at a bunch of those. I have an irresponsible number of slides tonight. Um, but uh, but anyway, we um, uh, were... I want to be looking, you know, that we, we get like eight or nine versions of some of these outlines and, 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 uh, uh, and, and scenes and things. Uh, and I'm really interested to see these things develop. So we're going to, we're going to, we're going to go through some of these, uh, uh, some of these perplexing things that gave Tolkien so much trouble. Uh, so to start off with, I want to look at, again, a, a, a a problem which was created for Christopher in the editing of things and trying to figure stuff out that was made by that same preface that I was just referring to when Tolkien descri- describes, you know, his process of writing. Um, and of course, the problem is that he says that he started writing book five, right? But then as the beacons flared in Anorian, um, you know, he, 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 he left off uh, and didn't come back to it for a while. And so what he says in the preface is that basically the well, it doesn't give the date at the time, but um, we've come to two breaks or two major breaks that Tolkien took where he didn't write for like more than a year on the Lord of the Rings. Uh, the one it, it, where he when he stopped in 1942 and uh, the second one when he stopped in 1944. Right. So based on the account that he gives, he says that he stopped in 19, uh, that basically he got to this point in 1942. And that's what Christopher Tolkien says that he sort of always assumed. Right. Um, But then he he gives this piece of evidence um, that he unearthed that shows the actual date of that. Um, This is a letter to him. He says, I began trying to write again. I would on brink of term on Tuesday, but I struck a most awkward error one or two days in the synchronization, the important at this stage, of movements of Frodo and the others, which has cost labor and thought and will require tiresome small alterations in many chapters. But at any rate, I have actually begun book five and last about ten chapters per book. Book five and last, right? Yeah. 
I had taken in view. So this is Christopher. I had taken in view of what he had, what he said years later, the words that I have italicized to mean that my father had begun Minas Tirith anew and supposed that in this brief reference, he simply passed over the fact that the beginning of the chapter and the beginning of the muster of Rohan was long since in existence or else that the earlier beginning had now been rejected and set aside. But the words are much more naturally taken to mean what they say. I have actually begun Book 5, on 10 October 1944, ab initio. And if they are so taken, the entire problem disappears. The problem is Faramir is referred to in some of these early drafts, which he had originally thought were from 1942. But of course, we remember the Faramir stuff can be dated exactly from those letters that Tolkien wrote uh, to Christopher in South Africa. Um, I remember as we, we were when we were looking at that those passages from before. So any passage that refers to Faramir can't have been written before 1944. So here was Christopher all confused about this stuff. Um, okay. The abandoned opening is not lost, and it is indeed the curious isolated page C in midget type, that is the, type, uh, the, 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 the typed out sheet that he, that he wrote. But it was written in 1944, not 1942. The page A preceding B and C is indeed where the ideas of the beacon and the westbound Aaron writers first emerged. And since it was written in 1944, the appearance of Faramir represents no difficulty. Thus, in his letter of 29 October 19. 1944, cited on page 219, my father could say that book five and last opens with the ride of Gandalf to Minas Tirith. Some of this is written or sketched. It had been written or sketched in the previous month, right? Yeah, exactly. So now obviously one of the major take-home lessons from this, and this is not the first time that we have seen this, is that when Tolkien years later is talking about his process, and remember, this is not hugely numbers of years, huge numbers of years later, right? We're talking about, so he's writing in, you know, the mid forties, that that preface is written in the mid fifties, right? So it's a decade later. Um, and he's talking about how, you know, this came about. Um, and he's wrong. He's just, he's just, completely misremembering. It was not, that was not, you know, he didn't write that stuff back in 1942. He wrote it in 1944 and it's provable from this evidence that he wrote it in 1944. And again, we have seen this on multiple occasions. In fact, Tolkien's memory for when he thought of stuff and when he wrote things down is actually kind of bad. Um, I mean, goodness at London moot, uh, in the, the wonderful talk that John Garth gave, um, again, one of the whole premises of that was again, Tolkien being wrong there at a further removed when he was uh, referring several decades later to when he wrote, um, the first drafts of the music of the Ainur, uh, from the book of lost tales. And he said, and it's, it's not just that he happened to remember the date wrong. He thought that he had written that after, uh, he moved to Oxford, um, but it wasn't after he wrote, he, he, he moved to Oxford, uh, that, you know, the, the evidence that, you know, John Garth assembled is really very convincing, uh, that he clearly wrote that, uh, in 1917, b before he moved to Oxford. Uh, and again, there are multiple examples of this. I rem you know, uh, I remember one as well from John Ratliff's history of the Hobbit when, um, and again, like he has this memory, like I remember sitting in this room, in this house, writing this chapter and it seems like he's wrong, actually. <laughs> like, he was not in that house. He was in a different house when he wrote that chapter. Um, it's just like that kind of thing happens. Now, goodness knows, and of course, I, 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 uh, I trust that you all understand that I'm not criticizing Tolkien and trying to make fun of Tolkien for making these kinds of mistakes. Uh, I can't even remember what I did two weeks ago, so I would be completely hopeless uh, when trying to look back 10 years, 20 years, 50 years later, sometimes some of his recollections are, um, about, you know, what I said, when good grief. Um, so again, it's not that there's anything surprising about that, but it's, I think it's just, it's really important to be reminded of this because, uh, often people will basically get in the habit of looking for like these moments when Tolkien says, this is what I remember. This is when I wrote this. Um, 
And we'll just kind of take that as like, well, that's like an indisputable truth. It is so not indisputable. Uh, he is often wrong. Uh, Tony Meade says he has a memory like a lumber room. <laughs> Possibly. Possibly. Um, uh, yeah, and Kate, absolutely, given how often he rewrote, it certainly is easy to understand his confusion about creation. I don't doubt that the memories, especially those memories that are linked to a particular place, like I remember sitting in my study in our house in Oxford, you know, writing this, you know, on this, you know, the house that the, this this house on this street writing this. I have no doubt that, you know, he's not just making it up, right? You know, that, that there is a real memory there. But Kate, yeah, I imagine what, what he's doing is remembering you know, thinking about that passage or revising that passage or, you know, you know, there's there probably was a version of that passage that he wrote in that room. Um, it's just not the it's just not the first one. Um, so anyway, I just I, I, I found this was a really uh, kind of fun moment from an editorial standpoint. And I think it's again, it's just a really important reminder uh, when you're dealing with uh, what authors say about their own works. Okay, but anyway, let's get uh, let's get to the to the heart of the action here. So, um, first, uh, this is the the what the little tiny chapter one here of this section uh, in the book that is the page that should have gone into the Treason of Isengard, but uh, Christopher Tolkien didn't find it until after the Treason of Isengard was published. Um, and this is from that long outline of the story foreseen from Lorien, right? And we talked about that a lot at the time but we get more of it, right? So before we look at the, the way in which the plan for the battle is, is, is growing up, um, it's important, of course, for us to go back and, and look at this projection that he was making here uh, for you know, this, 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 this original thought for how, how the story was going to end uh, and how the Gondorian stuff was going was gonna to come through. Okay. News comes at the feast at Edoras, or next morning, of the siege of, Min of Minas Tirith by the Haradwaith. The horse of Rohan ride east with Gandalf, Aragorn, Gimli, Legolas, Merry, and Pippin. Gandalf is the white rider, visions of Minas Tirith from afar. Battle before walls, sorties from city. Aragorn puts Haradwaith to flight. Aragorn enters into Minas Tirith and becomes their chief. Recollection of the boding words as spoken by Boromir. The forces of Minas Tirith and Rohan under Aragorn and Gandalf cross the Anduin and retake Elos Tyrion, the Nazgul. How Gandalf drove them back. Wherever the shadow of the Nazgul fell, there was a blind darkness. Men fell flat or fled, but about Gandalf there was always a light, and where he rode, the shadow retreated. Okay, so... Uh, well, actually, let's just go on because I, it just this it just continues. Um, keep your cap. Uh, oh, sorry, I skipped a bit. Right then, they get to the Black Gate and the the they 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 have the parley right uh, where they they and they're you know the they're told that uh, they have Frodo and they're they're told to surrender. Uh, this is of course. Where again, you know, as we've seen so many times before, his outline has become dialogue. Right? Um, uh, this is the end of the. This is the end of the outline. Uh, uh, and Gandalf's response, which is fairly awesome: "Keep your captive until the battle is over, Sauron. For verily, if the day goes to me, and we do not then find him unharmed, it shall go very ill with you." Not you alone have power. To me also is given of is given of retribution, and to you it will seem very terrible. But if the day is yours, then you must do with us all that remain alive as you will. So indeed you would do in any case, whatever oath or treaty you might now make. Gandalf explains that Frodo is probably not captive, for at any rate Sauron has not got the ring. Otherwise he would not seek to parley. The story must return to Sam and Frodo at the moment when Gandalf and Aragorn ride past Minas Morgul and go down to moment when Ring is destroyed. Then, just as Gandalf rejects Parley, there is a great spout of flame and the forces of Sauron fly. Aragorn and Gandalf and their host pour into Gorgoroth. Part of battle could be seen by Frodo from his tower while a prisoner. Okay, um... One thing that we can see, just looking at both of these uh, passages, you can see how prominent 
Gandalf is, right? Um, the, 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 the growth of Gandalf into his, the, his full stature, indeed into a stature greater than we ever see explicitly stated. I think he has this kind of stature, but um, this is even more overt than we get in the published text. Gandalf's journey is complete at this point now, right? And I, when I say Gandalf's journey, I mean sort of the, the creative journey, right? His journey as a character from the little old man who knocks on Bilbo's door in the first chapter of The Hobbit to the still professional wizard, right? Um, who is probably still just a guy who's a professional wizard uh, in the first drafts of The Fellowship of the Ring. And now he has grown and grown and is now clearly the opposing power of Sauron, right? I mean, his words to Sauron here are rem- not you alone have power, right? I, if the day goes to me and we do not find him unharmed, it shall go very ill with you. To me also a power is given of retribution, and to you it will seem very terrible. This is uh, this is Gandalf threatening Sauron. It seems Sauron himself has come to the parley, not not any intermediary, right? But Sauron himself. Um, Stephen says that Gandalf's speech is almost disturbingly tough here, right? I mean, yeah, this is... Um, this is Gandalf the Grey uncloaked. This is Gandalf the White uncloaked, right? Um, every covering, uh, every doubt, uh, every you know, sort of mitigating factor is uh, is is removed. Um, and this is clearly Gandalf and Sauron as the two central forces. The light and darkness that we saw in the outline before there is it makes that equally clear already, right? You've got the shadow. Uh, from Mordor, right? The, the, you know, that we've already seen the darkness kind of go. Well, no, we saw the darkness growing, but that was after this. I'm forgetting that we're jumping back. This passage actually belongs back in the Treason of Isengard. So we haven't had the, 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 uh, the encroaching uh, shadow. We don't, we don't have the dawnless day yet. Um, but nevertheless, the shadow has been, you know, uh, associated with Mordor from chapter two on. So um, anyway, yeah. So we have the shadow of Mordor being cast over things here, but then we have, you know, where Gandalf is, there is always light, right? So the Gandalf is the light to oppose the shadow of Sauron um, is, again, very overt, uh, very, um, um, uh, very, very plain. And we've seen this in a couple other places, right? Where he sort of states ex- in, in these drafts, uh, and outlines especially, he states explicitly these uh, these concepts, which are going to become more beneath the surface, right, as he revises uh, and as he writes out the full prose versions of them. Um, but um, going back a little bit here to the um, to the earlier bits, to the shape of the battle, right. Um, no, notice several things that we see from the very beginning. Now, I call this the old new battle plan. Um, so let's recall first what the original battle plan was. You may remember that the a battle at Minas, a climactic battle at Minas Tirith, was always the plan, right? Even from way back when he had the faintest idea of what was going on, right? Um, you know, he didn't know anything about the lands in between. He hadn't invented Rohan yet. You know, none of this stuff. You know, Boromir was uh, uh, was going to turn traitor and betray Gondor, remember? All that stuff uh, from early on in The Return of the Shadow, even. Um, so the original thing was the, the the original battle plan at Minas Tirith was that Minas Tirith was going to be besieged by armies coming from both directions. We had Sauron and his armies coming in from the east, and we had Isengard, we had Saruman and his armies coming in from the west, and they were meeting there. And um, you'll remember Gandalf, when Gandalf first comes back from the dead and meets up with Legolas and Gimli, and he comes back and they, we had like Gandalf and Treebeard coming in as this sort of you catastrophic intervention into the battle there. Aragorn was already there, Aragorn and Boromir in some versions, right? Um, but that was, that was the thing. That was the big, um, that was, that was the, and, 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 and that, ba- with very little beyond that battle, 
um, was really projected. The battle, the final battle, not necessarily the biggest battle, but the last battle, um, was shifting to Daggerlad already as he began doing the outline um, uh, for bringing Frodo and Sam uh, to... uh, uh, to Mordor. And the idea of the horns in the hills, right, as we got the very first beginnings of the idea of this sort of late arriving to the battle cavalry who will uh, who will change the tide of things. Um, so anyway, yeah, that's um, that's that's, I think. Um, we can already see, I'm not sure exactly to what extent the shifting of the of that final scene to Daggerlad was already beginning to reduce the emphasis on the big besieging of the city, right? Um, but it is changing. And here we can see now a very significant change. Obviously, um, we don't have Saruman involved here anymore at all, right? Which is interesting, which is kind of early for that, actually, if I'm remembering correctly, but it's hard to remember exactly where, you know, this would fit in the Treason of Isengard. But um, anyway, um, so the number one thing that I find extremely striking, there are lots of smaller details that are really, that really pop out at you, right? When you look at this, at this plan for the Battle of Minas Tirith. Um, But the, the, the thing that strikes me most is the overall shape of it. There is a battle before the walls, right? There are sorties from the city, but this is primarily an offensive uh, fight, right? Um, Aragorn fights the Haradwaith, so the Haradwaith are the primary enemies, right? The armies that are coming up from the south now are the the the, the primary folks fighting. Uh, on the field of Minas Tirith. So they're coming up to the city, but it is not primarily a siege. Aragorn attacks them from outside. Somehow. Not really sure how that works, right? Presumably he has help and doesn't single-handedly put them to flight. Um, But anyway, Aragorn and some army uh, put the Haradwaith to flight, and then they go on the offensive, right? They retake... Osgiliath. Remember, Elos Tyrion was the, the, one of the names of Osgiliath for a while. Um, Aragorn and Gandalf cross the Anduin and retake Elos Tyrion. The Nazgul. Okay, so we're having Nazgul issues, but Gandalf is driving them back, right? Um, m- notice the Nazgul issues are not over the city. We don't have the city surrounded, oppressed, besieged, with a Nazgul looming over it and creating this atmosphere of horror and despair. And that's not it at all. Right? It's threatened as the armies approach, but then they're beaten on the field, and then they move forward. They retake Elos Tyrion. They're going to go and, and get and, and retake Minas Morgul. I skipped this bit, but they're going to go and retake Minas Morgul. Right? And then they're going to go up and fight at, the, at, the, at the, the Black Gate. And notice what happens when they do. Right? I was emphasizing the Gandalf bit in the second bit, but um, uh, there's, no, there's no battle. Right. They don't even fi- that again. Remember how in the published text, once again, we get that image of, you know, the good guys besieged right up on their little three hills as the armies flow up towards them like a tide in this battle that they can't possibly hope to survive unaided. And then wham, right. The mountain explodes. The ring is destroyed. The black tower falls and uh, the enemy scatters. But that's not how it happens here. Right. They're drawn up, they have their parley, and then, bam, before the battle begins, so that the pass opens and they swarm down. What's that, uh, what's that, uh, right, uh, Gandalf, uh, Aragorn and Gandalf and their host pour into Gorgoroth, right? So again, they are the victorious, conquering army uh, in this. So that's a big, um, that's a big shift from the... Uh, but not only from the published text, but from that original version, where again the whole climax was the east and west sandwiching attack, meeting and trying to crush Minas Tirith and getting uh, and getting uh, fought off. Um, Arthur, uh, so Frodo's a prisoner in the tower. He, here he's just making pointers to himself for when he's going to jump the narrative, right? So. We're going to have the... So, according to this uh, projection, as I understand it, um, 
we're going to have Gandalf in the city. We're going to have uh, Gandalf and Pippin are going to be in the city. We're going to have Aragorn coming in uh, with somebody's army. I don't know whose, uh, and is going to attack the Haradwaith and going to drive them off. Then they together, Gandalf and Aragorn now together, Gandalf's going to be taken as uh, accepted as what? what is the chief? What, what's he? Where's the thing? Where does he say? Uh, I'm trying to remember the word here. Chief, yeah. Aragorn enters Minas Tirith and becomes their chief. Um, anyway, yeah, so they take Aragorn as chief. Aragorn and Gandalf go, and they do their they do their invasion thing, right? Um, but um, anyway, so so the, the point is that narrative continues, and then they come to Minas Morgul. Right, and they get to Minas Morgul, and they uh, uh, and they, you know, they're 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 retaking Athelion as they go. He's so he's putting a cue to himself at that point, right? When they now he's got to shift the narrative back to Sam and Frodo, right? Sam and so Sam's got to rescue Frodo from his imprisonment, and remember, Frodo's imprisonment goes back all the way back to this outline. Right. Um, so Sam, Frodo's going to be in prison. Sam's got to rescue him. Then they've got to make it across into Mordor. So that bit, the rescue, the getting to Mordor, the going to the mountain. This is apparently not going to take too long. Right. Everybody knows that's going to be it's all going to be super efficient. Um, that's going to happen while the army is marching north to the Black Gate. So that then and he, notice he says, uh, what does he say? Go down to the moment when the ring is destroyed. Right. So we're going to get when the army of the West marches past Minas Morgul. Narrative shifts to Frodo and Sam. We get them from the tower where they're in, where Frodo is imprisoned, which was at this time Minas Morgul and later, of course, Tower of Kirathungal. And we're going to go all the way to this to the destruction of the ring in the narrative. Then we're going to cut back to the main uh, army. Right. We're going to cut back to Aragorn and Gandalf. So it's just cues for how he's planning to interlace the narrative there. Um, yeah, and, uh, and yeah, absolutely no, um, there's, we've, we've got no army of the, we are, we are still a hundred miles from an army of the dead, right? Um, still a hundred miles from that. Um, and we're going to, we're going to see how that, um, um, how that, how that works, how that, how that comes out. Um, yeah, yeah. Okay, so and wait, and there was another question. Uh, was oh um. Oh yes, Tara. Uh, Tara was saying, is the source of Gandalf's light in any way related to the light in Galadriel's file? It's interesting, isn't it? I mean, it's especially interesting reading this uh, outline again after again reading it for the first time, but going back to this outline after um. We've just done Kirith Ungol, right, and all the business about the file, and we've, and especially with Ungoliant and Arendel and all that stuff in our heads, right, uh, to come back to, to this and see Gandalf with the light and shadow there. It's different. On the one hand, it's definitely different in the sense that, um, in, um, with the with the file of Galadriel in particular, um. We're talking about the light of the Silmaril, right? We're talking about the light of Eärendil's star. So this is not just like light, you know, sort of radiating and showing. The, I mean, Gandalf is like just as the power of Sauron manifests itself in the oppression of the wills of others and as visibly manifested in the shadow, right, and, and in darkness, so the power of Gandalf manifests itself in hope and inspiration and physically manifests itself as light, right? Um, and that's not exactly what we're seeing in the file of Galadriel. The file of Galadriel is, in a sense, a little bit more complicated than that, or maybe it's more simple. I don't even know if it's a simple or complex if it's a simplicity or complexity issue, but um, but specifically that has to do with the light of Arendelle's star, right? Um, so, but of course it is associated with Sam's hope and Sam's will, right? As, uh, you know, with his will behind it, the file is able to bring them into, you know, bring him past the Watchers and all that kind of thing. Um, uh, Tony says, is that the secret fire he serves? No, it's... Um, um, it's the flame that he wields. It's it's more like that, right? Um, 
wielder of the flame of honor is more like the kind of thing that he's talking about here, the power that he is, um, that he is manifesting, that he is, that he is using, that he's showing. Um, and so Mike, I would definitely say again, off light is more fiery than the files starlight. We see him associated with fire and, and, uh, no, though the light of the file kind of burns in Ungoliant slash Shelob's eyes, right? Um, but it's the brightness of the light. It's not really fiery, exactly. Um, uh, John asks, is Gandalf a ring bearer at this point? I don't think so. I don't think so. I'm trying to remember now. And somebody who has leisure to look it up, please do look it up. See if you can find anything. But as I recall, he hasn't talked about the three rings in ages. And the only time he did talk about the three rings any time recently was in his sort of reaffirming his decision to say that the three rings were made by Celebrimbor alone and not touched by Sauron. Because um, remember, John, uh, you know, even the last time the, in the most recent version of the Council of Elrond, um, the rings were still made by Sauron. The three rings were made by Sauron. So um, it was only, you'll recall, when we passed through Lorien and met Galadriel that being a ring bearer was even like a desirable thing. Um, uh, so, I mean, you know, a bearer of one of the three rings. And I don't recall any reference to Gandalf being one of them at that point. Um, I might be misremembering, but I don't. I don't recall anything like that. If anybody, uh, um, if any, if if I'm wrong, somebody correct me. Okay. Um, yeah, Tony, I agree. The light does seem to be associated with will and and uh, and self determination, while the shadow is the removal of the will and self. Yes, the domination of one will by another, uh, the oppression of the will of others, um, uh, the, the 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 cowing and the diminishing of their spirits. Right. Um, uh, whereas, yes, Gandalf is all about, you know, uh, enheartening and building up the spirits of others. So, yeah, yeah. Okay, all right. Um, and so the business about part of the battle could be seen by Frodo from his tower while a prisoner. That line I suspect to be chronologically, he's just, this is again him almost free associating as he's thinking about how to do the narratives here. Um, part of the battle, I believe, not the battle at Dagorlad, not the battle at the Black Gate, because yes, Frodo would not be in his tower, uh, a prisoner, he would be busy casting the ring into Mount Doom at the time, right? Or escaping flows of lava afterwards, or f- wrestling with Nazgul after throwing the the ring into the uh, into the fire or whatever. But um, so no, the battle. I believe part of the battle at Minas Morgul, or even at Minas Tirith. Um, or even at Elos Tyrion, like one of those earlier battles uh, he would see. And this here, I think, is simply Tolkien attempting to synchronize the chronology. Um, I've said, you know, I've been saying ever since we've been doing the War of the Ring that I'm not extremely interested in going back and looking at all of the, the like, the intricacies of the changes that Tolkien is making and the tweaks that he does uh, to adjust the chronology. But, of course, I do want to acknowledge that this is obviously a big issue, right? Uh, And, I, you know, Christopher's pursuit of it, I think, is really cool. Uh, Obviously, it was something that really bothered Tolkien. Christopher suggests that it's the chronological tangle of things that ultimately kind of makes Tolkien throw up his hands and set it aside for a while and not come back to it for like a year and a half. So, um, you know, this is obviously an issue. So I, I this that's what I think that is. This is just a like he thought of a a thing to like to use to serve as a kind of a, a chronological touchstone between his two plots threads. Uh, so uh, uh, so Arthur he just kind of you know slapped it in there at the end of that outline is how I read that. Anyway, okay, all right, but let us move forward to book five. 
we're now kind of rejoining the president. We you know back up to 1944, where we are having looked at uh, all the stuff we've been doing. He's written uh, the the Kirith Ungol stuff, and now he's gonna turn back to Gandalf and uh, Pippin and Aragorn and the rest of them and try to figure out now what on earth is going on. Is obviously the old plan of the siege from east and west isn't gonna happen because Saruman's already taken care of, and his army's already been dealt with. Um, out in uh, Helm's Deep, so uh, so so we need a new plan. Okay, here's Pippin. He stirred. Where are we? He said, passing through the land of Anorian, which is a realm of Gondor. Said Gandalf. Now we have turned southward. Dawn is at hand. Open your eyes. Beacons, messengers, riding west. This is that passage that Christopher was referring to about where it looks like. He's underlined this beacons, messengers, right. And, and it, so this outline at this moment has the feeling of him first coming up with that idea so that this is the, where the idea of the beacons. So as they ride um, south, as Gandalf and Pippin are riding south, they're seeing the beacons light up coming towards them going north. Right. Um, OK. Um, so. OK. Description of Minas Tirith and its immense concentric walls. They come to presence of Denethor and hear news which Gandalf supplements. Gandalf remains hidden, communing, maybe, within with himself. Pippin on the battlements. The allies come in. Faramir returns. War and siege. Gondor defeated. Ships of Harad. New force from north. Episode of the Palantir and Gandalf. No sign of riders. Okay. Bunch of ideas here, some of which won't be clear for a long time, and of course many of which will change. Um, but of course we can see many of the elements which are g- very familiar, right? The beacons, of course. The description of Minas Tirith as Gandalf approaches it, you know, with Pippin on Shadowfax. Um, the first conversations with Denethor, but notice there's no hint of any... Well, story there, right? With Denethor. Denethor doesn't do much, doesn't have, you know, we don't get any sense. We've not, anyway, yet been given any sense of Denethor's personality. Remember, he was um, uh, Tolkien offed him pretty quickly in the earlier thing. Like, that was the whole point is that Denethor, he's the Lord of Minas Tirith, but he needs to get rid of him, right? Uh, Denethor was going to die in the battle pretty quickly so that they could have the... Originally, remember, they had the big decision, like, are they going to take for their... The people of Minas Tirith, are are they going to take for their lord uh, Boromir, Denethor's son, who was still alive at the time, or are they going to take Aragorn, the new guy, right? And, of course, they were going to end up taking Aragorn, which is what drove Boromir to betrayal back when he survived before uh, Tolkien decided safely to kill him off. But, um, you know, that way uh, he's out of danger. So, uh, and you'll re- recall, of course, that their decision to embrace Aragorn is like a reversal of their decision, the decision that the people of Gondor made to boot the Numenorians out before that was way back during that uh, sort of concept of the thing, long before the, the idea of the return of the king really became a central uh, motif, a central concept uh, in the story. Um, so... So anyway, okay, so that's where we had Denethor, right? We had the Lord of Minas Tirith, um, and he's, but he's he's still, there's not much story about him, right? There's there's very little, there's like nothing to see here. Um, uh, yeah, okay, good, excellent. James, thank you. James Lieback says that uh, uh, a cursory scan of the treason of Isengard by those of us with leisure to investigate does not show any evidence that Tolkien had decided where to, where to bestow the other two elven rings. Good. That's what I remembered also a lack of evidence, but I, I wasn't 100 percent sure. So thank you for checking that. Um, OK. We get the return of Faramir, right? Because Faramir, Faramir is around now. So we've got Faramir coming back. We need to integrate him into the battle plans. Is Denethor going to die or not? Notice we don't know. We don't, it's again, he's not a major issue, right? Uh, there doesn't seem, there's no particular thing with him and Gandalf. There's no, um, you know, he certainly doesn't have any dramatic end uh, that is anticipated here. Um, 
War in Siege, Gondor defeated, ships of Harad. Okay, so now we had the people, the 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 Harad wife, right? You know, coming in, they were they were going to be the primary aggressors in the in in the fight. They were going to be the army defeated in front of Minas Tirith. Um, so now we have the they're coming up in ships, right? So this is uh, uh, the, the their ships are definitely going to be involved. And there's a new force from the north. Uh, which makes sense because, of course, there's always been lots of goblins in the Misty Mountains. So we're going to bring some orcs down uh, from the north uh, into Rohan, and that could get bad. So we'll see about that episode of the Palantir and Gandalf. We'll get to that one eventually, um, though that takes a little bit of a while and no sign of riders. So this idea of the anticipating, uh, the, the anticipation as as they wait for the riders, um, but figuring out what actually is happening with the riders is going to take a little while. Um, yeah, Kate, I do agree that it is interesting that the idea of Gandalf having a power, right, like this, is going to later result in him being a ring bearer, right? Um, yes, I agree. In a sense, Kate, I think, I want to do this carefully because this is not a, a very... It's not a great way to talk about this stuff anyway, but I would say that Gandalf's becoming a ring bearer in a sense seems to be a reduction of his personal um, power, right? Um, in that outline, you know, that uh, lost page from the Treason of Isengard uh, outline, we see Gandalf, you know, just in himself going toe-to-toe with Sauron, saying either you're going to win, or I'm the representative of light, you're the representative of darkness, either you're going to win or I'm going to win. If, I, if you win, we're going to be at your mercy, those of us who survive. If I win, you are going to be at my ver- mercy, and you're not going to like it, Buster, right? Again, you know, and that's no ring, right? No supplement of any kind, that's just Gandalf in himself. Um, the dynamics are going to change, right, as he becomes a ring bearer. Um, yeah, and I agree, Get that Gandalf, that Gandalf was a little bit haughty. I think that's a really good word, Stephen. Um, it doesn't sound quite like Gandalf, does it, to, uh, to, uh, Catreon, as you said, to talk smack to Sauron like that. Exactly. Um, yeah. Okay. All right. Let's keep going. Looking, uh, uh, skipping ahead here, and again, I want to be focusing on kind of the shape of the story as he's building it here. Again, you can see how he continues to build even through draft and draft and draft. He's still thinking of the the battles, right, as being primarily offensive. So here's another outline. People come in from Belfalas and Dom, Dom, and Dom Amroth and from the five streams of Lebenin uh, in Anarion. There came Imram the Tall from the Vale of Something or Other, and Nosdiligand, and the people of the Delta, and Ben Rodier, Prince of Anarion, and the remnants of the folk of Athelion across the Vale, and something from Rovanian, something men of the East, and rangers from the Empty North, and even some of the folk of Dunland. Written against this passage in the margin, King of Rohan, men of Rohan come after the assembly, only Aragorn road to it. Now, note, I'm taking these passages out of sequence because I'm trying to follow a couple threads here. We'll come back to this issue later on because, of course, you will you may remember that this issue of other people like uh, people from Rovani and people uh, from, like uh, woodmen from the eaves of Mirkwood, rangers from the north, even Dunlendings. Uh, coming together as allies uh, to join in the fight against Sauron is located initially in Rohan, right? It's part of the muster in Rohan. This is, as I recall, the first passage where that is getting shifted uh, to Minas Tirith, um, which is itself a kind of an interesting thing, right? As he's making the 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 sort of the 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 locus of that kind of. Um, of that, of that gathering, ma- making, making that the focal point, not the, the muster of Rohan be the sort of the focal point, gathering together all the allies and then bringing them down, uh, to Gondor, but having them gather there in Gondor itself. And of course, 
you'll remember that this is, in a sense, kind of retained, right? Or rather, this seems to grow into that scene with Burgill and Pippin watching the people from the Outlands coming in, right? This idea of people gathering to the call of, you know, the Lord of the City uh, sticks. But it's no longer, you know, it's no longer this, like, international task force, right? Um, yeah. Um, yeah, good. Yeah, Tomas, I, no, no participation from the Bjornings. We, I mean, unless they're included with the Woodmen, right? Which they might be, uh, as those were the people that Bjorn went to rule over. So maybe, you know, he doesn't use the name Bjorning, but maybe it is, uh, you could say, the Bjornings there that he's talking about. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, Kate, one of the footnotes does refer to it as a kind of Homeric uh, list of allies. Yeah, the, the, the list is Homeric, but the concept is um, sort of shifting around, right? Uh, and this is, of course, as I said, the place where it's shifting to Rohan. Anyway, we'll, we'll come back to that. We'll talk about this more later on uh, when we get to the earlier versions of it. When we talk about that, I'm trying to trying to talk about the Gondor stuff, and then we'll shift and we'll talk about the Rohan stuff here. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm wanting here first to look at the big picture of the development of the battle stuff and, and kind of the story down there in Gondor. Okay. And the Council of Denethor was to retake the fords of Osgiliath and drive back the orcs. So they sounded their trumpets and flew the red banner from the tower and rode to meet the enemy. And the enemy could not withstand the swords of Gondor. And before the sword of Elendil they fled like something or other. But Gandalf stood on the hill and watched afar. Then comes the fleet of the Swertings, changed to Harns, up from the delta, and the Swertings came up through Ithilien. They watch for the men of Rohan who are late, maybe. Uh, definitely late, but that's maybe what it says. Men of Rohan camp nearby and charge in the morning, then the Nazgul come. Okay. Uh, so again, notice the shape of this. That's still offensive, right? We still have not, you know, Gondor attempting to withstand a siege, but rather Gondor sounding their trumpets, flying the red banner, and riding to meet their enemy, and succeeding. Um, the attack, you know, the, the force that Denethor sends out, the one that Faramir leads, which nearly results in his death, um, and which seems to be, which Faramir himself counsels against, right? Though he's willing to lead it when his father insists. Um, uh, it, it, it's funny to think that it originally won, right? You know, this this attack, the ordering of which is going to be one of the signs that Denethor is slipping, right? In the published text is like the victorious stroke in the original outline, right? Because again, they are the, 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 the main story we can see. And again, remember, this is when we look at version after version, this is to me always the, the important question, right? This is what I always want to see. It's not about, you know, I, I find if you try, if you just get, allow yourself to kind of get lost in, in uh, details, you know, in, in sort of like trivia, in a sense of just, you know, when do names get changed and when do events come in and everything, you know, reading eight different versions of the same story, each one slightly different from the other might kind of get a little deadening. To me, the important question is always, what kind of story is this, right? And how is that core story changing over time? And the core story here is still Offensive, And we can see these details that are emerging, right? The trumpets, the red banner, right? Um, the enemy not being able to withstand the swords of Gondor reminds me of the Noldor arriving, right? And just mowing down the orcs uh, in the first few battles in North Beleriand, right? Before the sword of Elendil, they fled like something or other. Uh, and that is kind of an ironic moment, Karita. I agree. It's kind of comical that we don't know what they fled like, but it was something. You know, um, yeah, yeah, um, yeah, exactly. Um, and, uh, and yeah, I, I, Lynn, I agree. Denethor is clearly part of the team, right? 
uh, Denethor is definitely part of the team. Um, and, uh, yeah, there's no, there's still no, no glimpse of anything kind of shaky or negative about about Denethor here. Again, his command is is good counsel, right? And they win. Um, the idea that the Rohirrim are going to come in late but turn the tide still there. But notice it's the sort of the second battle. So again, we're not having a siege. This seems to push back the siege even more. The main battle against the Haradwaith is going to come in Athelion, right? From us, Gilead. And then we've got an army coming down and an army coming up and they're going to get crushed. And that's when the Rohirrim are going to come in. In Athelion, I guess? I'm not 100% sure of how the geography is working out here. Um, but um, that, that's... And notice Gandalf. Gandalf is watching from afar. Gandalf is holding himself back. After that early outline, the one we were looking at before, the Gandalf talking smack outline... Um, after that outline, he's pulling Gandalf back a lot, right? Gandalf doesn't want to reveal himself. Gandalf is, is sort of trying not to uncloak himself, right, in his power. Um, and notice also that the Nazgul are a late wave of the battle, right? First, we've got the occupying army in Osgiliath, smashed by Aragorn and the men of Minas Tirith. Then we've got the Haradwaith coming up, right? Uh, engaged by Aragorn and the men of Gondor, and then smashed by the Rohirrim. The Rohirrim come, turn the tide of battle, and they win that battle too. Then the Nazgul come. The Nazgul are not part of the initial... Uh, of, of, of They're like, you know, the advanced wave of, uh, you know, military problems that the men of Gondor are facing, but they're facing it all as they advance deeper and deeper into the terrain of the enemy. And that's a very different story uh, than we see in the published text. Okay. But, of course, Faramir is awesome now, right? We have Faramir, and he's alluded to the fact that Faramir is coming back, but we don't know what uh, Faramir is doing, so we need, to, uh, we need to, 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 to work him in. Here's an outline, Book 5 outline. Okay. Gandalf comes with Pippin to Minas Tirith. Uh, and, and I'm going to skip, sort of, you know, the dates or anyway, I'm not going to worry about them much. But again, that note that uh, a lot of this stuff is jotted in later as he's trying to notice all the changes to the dates and everything. I'm not going to worry about that too much. Uh, but again, you can see him trying to tweak all this stuff and make it all work and fit together. Gandalf comes with Pippin to Minas Tirith, February five or six. Faramir, the allies come in. Urgent messages are sent to Theoden. Uh, I love just that one, Faramir, right? Yeah, Faramir totally happens. Messages must bid Rohirrim assemble at Edoras as soon as may be after the full moon of February 6th. Theoden reaches Dunharrow February 8th, Edoras February 10th. Again, he's still trying to work out the chronology. Denethor only willing to hold his walls. Knowing war drawing near, he has long set out summons to allies they are coming in. But the messengers to Theoden, his chief ally, have not returned yet. Gandalf tells of Theoden's war. Gandalf and Pippin on battlements. See shadow as Nazgul sweep over river. Notice how the shadow accompanies the Nazgul, right? Like the darkness is an expression of his power, which is manifested through the Nazgul. Faramir comes on night of February... 7th changed to 8. At same time, changed to next day, comes news of war at Osgiliath. Orcs led by Nazgul have crossed the river. Fleet from Umbar is approaching mouths of Anduin. Faramir su supports Gandalf's policy of attack by sortie on the plain. The first battle. The mountaineers drive the orcs back and burn ships. But orcs win through. Nazgul. Minas Tirith forces driven back Still Gandalf something on the battlements stays, I guess. Well, I don't know what the word is, but him staying on the battlements seems to be what's still happening here. So, okay. So what what happens when Faramir comes? As Faramir comes in, interestingly, the story begins to shift now. Uh, in this version of the outline, the story is beginning to shift into a more defensive thing. Notice what we get now that we didn't before. The oncoming of the shadow. Right, the army of orcs shadowed by the Nazgul. The Nazgul came in late after like two battles that already happened before. Right now, they're coming in, and I love that image of the 
um, you know, sort of the, the sea shadow as Nazgul sweep over river, right? Um, so there, we're watching the the literal closing in of shadow uh, on Minas Tirith, um, and we get our first kind of uh, differences, right? Um, Gandalf has the pol- Gandalf wants to attack. Denethor now wants to defend. Right? Denethor is only willing to hold his walls. Um, but Faramir, Gandalf wants to attack, and Faramir wants to attack. So Gandalf still wants this to be an offensive fight. And Faramir is supporting him, but now we have it that's not any longer unanimous. I don't understand the business about the Mountaineers. Um, unless the Mountaineers refers to the people who crossed the pass and and come in, uh, like whether it's Aemir or Aragorn, we'll get to that later on, um, and, and come in and attack the army from the other side. Um, maybe that's who we're talking about here. Um, so, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, but, but that's just a guess. I'm not really sure about that. Um, nor do I know where the orcs are winning through from, um, or what the Nazgul are doing there. I mean, so much, so many of these things are just placeholders for stuff that we don't necessarily un- understand. Um, Minas Tirith force is driven back. So again, they're fighting on the plain. They're being driven back. Um, and still Gandalf is, I don't know what, hanging out on the battlements, right? Um, it is possible, Tony, that there are people who live in the White Mountains, the Mountaineers, um, that this is one of the allies, uh, no, one of the other allies that came late. That seems to me possible. Um, I'm inclined to think that this is the the other force, like the force that Aragorn's leading in. But but at the same time, we still seem to be losing uh, at this point, so I'm not quite sure about that. Okay, so flavor of things changing a little bit. Um, remember, Treebeard was the U catastrophe, right? Treebeard and Gandalf, their arrival at the big siege from east and west in the old versions of the battle were the things that turned the tide, right? So Treebeard was going to come wading in like Bjorn in the Battle of Five Armies and clear things out. Um, Theoden leaves Edoras February 11th with Aemir and Eowyn. And by the way, no evidence that Eowyn is hiding. She's like openly riding with Theoden, as far as I could tell. Ents drive off the attack in north of Rohan. They drive back orcs out of west, Anorian, and struck out February 15th, last quarter. Um, reach battle February 15. This is... Uh, so wait, who? Theoden? Or the ants? Or both? Hmm, not quite sure who's reaching the battle on February 15th there. Siege relieved by the Rohirrim and the allies of Lebenin. Gandalf comes for the Mountaineers, Tony, is that what we're talking about there? Gandalf comes forth and the enemy driven off. Theoden slain and Eowyn slays the king of the Nazgul and is mortally wounded. They lie in state in the White Tower. Gandalf, something or other. Aragorn, maybe. I don't know. I don't know, I don't know what they're doing. Cross the river at Osgiliath. Ents, elves and Ents drive orcs back. They reach Minas Morgul and press on to Dagorlad. Parley with Sauron. Okay, so we have the Ents intervening again, right? Um, remember he was thinking about an army coming down from the north, which would be coming down from the north into Rohan. Um, we're going to have the Ents drive that one off, right? Which, of course, is going to uh, um, is going to stay, right? They do that in the published text. It just doesn't make it into the narrative until Treebeard tells them about it after the fact, right? Um, but that's still going to happen. Um, once again, we have, you know, we see that the, 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 the thing that he was already leaning towards, right, this now increasingly once more defensive struggle, now we have the Rohirrim coming in to break a siege, Rather than to help them in the battlefield, remember it was maybe over in Athelion or something. Right now, uh, it is it is the lifting of a siege that's happening. Um, elves, in addition to Ents, are going to come down and intervene, um, but that's afterwards. That's at at Osgiliath. So 
Siege, Shadow, Nazgul, right, at Minas Tirith. Rohan comes in. Theoden is killed. Eowyn is killed. But she kills the Witch King, so that's good. Um, and then... And Gandalf comes forth and drives the enemy off, right? So that's nice. He gets to do what he doesn't get to do in the published text, right? He's about to go ride forth in the published text and he gets called upstairs, right? He doesn't, he gets, he, he, he actually makes it out in this earlier version, right? Um, but then again, we have the offensive struggle crossing the river at Osgiliath and apparently another battle, right? Over there in, in Athelion and elves involved. Elves from Lorien, I think. Um, I believe these elves are coming down from Lorien with the Ents. So that's fun. Okay. That business about Gandalf and the Palantir. Remember that reference in the early, uh, in the early thing. Um, in the early outline. Here it is. Remember, Gandalf still has the Palantir. He hasn't given it to Aragorn, right? And the question, and when we looked at the evolution of the Palantir, is he going to use it? Is he going to, you know, is it a two-way communication device at all? Um, uh, is he in danger? And we're going to, yes, okay, yes, it's a two-way communications device. Yes, Sauron has the other, Sauron's on the other end of the line, right? Is Gandalf going to, uh, going to, put him uh, on hold like he does. <laughs> Remember in that one awesome passage where he's like, sorry, Sauron, hang on. Just uh, please hold. Um, but um, anyway, okay. Gandalf keeps back not to reveal himself. So once again, Gandalf can see, you know, uh, uh, holding it in. As the siege grows and the armies of Gondor are pressed back, he looks in the Palantir. He catches sight of Frodo in tower and then Sauron cuts in. Gandalf gives a great shout and hurls the stone from the battlements. It slays a captain, so he chucks it down and kills somebody with it. Gandalf is now revealed. He rides forth. So, Gandalf, why is Gandalf standing on the battlements? Why is Gandalf not, like, shining the light and uh, saving everybody from the Nazgul? Because he doesn't want to reveal himself to Sauron. Right. Um, so once Sauron sees him, right, so he's he's using the Palantir to try to see what's going on with Frodo. Right. So like in the middle of the battle, he's like, hang on, I got I, I, I to check on Frodo. Right. So he pulls out his Palantir and he looks in and he sees Frodo uh, and then Sauron photo bombs him. Right. And jumps in and he's like, hey, right. Uh, I've got your hobbit. Uh, and, and he even writes in, Sauron is holding the coat, right? He's like, look, yeah, I got your, I got his mithril coat here. He's totally, this totally your hobbit. I got your boy here. And, and then Gandalf's like, okay, all right. Gandalf's made now, right? So he reveals himself, um, and, uh, rides forth and the Nazgul come and, uh, but you know, he's, uh, unleashing his fire at that point. Um, uh, yeah, so Karina Gandalf uh, brains somebody with the, <laughs> with the Palantir. I don't know what's up with that. Uh, yeah, um, and no, I don't think I I don't think it's one of I don't think it's one of the good guys. I think it's I think it's he's hitting one of the bad guys. He's throwing it off the parapet. So I think he's up on the outer walls and he chucks it down. So I don't I don't I don't I don't, I don't think it's the Gondorian captain uh, that he uh, that he kills. But yeah, Stephen, it is kind of strangely parallel to Wormtongue chucking the Palantir, isn't it? I mean, it's uh, um, this this impulse to use the Palantir as a missile weapon uh, is uh, somewhat uh, somewhat puzzling. So. Um, Anyway, okay, all right. Um, by the way, um, I think that although this scene might seem a little funny, um, it is scene is a little funny, um, and of course we know it's going to change. Notice there are a couple seeds here, which are going to bear fruit in the uh, in the published text. Right. First, of course, Aragorn using the Palantir 
and revealing himself to Sauron. Except it's going to work the other way around. Instead of him trying to see what's going on and then getting caught, right, and getting made by Sauron, instead, what he's going to do, it's going to work the other way. First, he's going to deliberately reveal himself. Then he's going to wrench the stone to his will and look around, right? But nevertheless, this idea of, you know, sort of doing the two things and then having this confrontation with Sauron, um, that's going to stick around. Except it's not going to be Gandalf, it's not going to happen here, and it's not going to happen now. But the other thing that I think is is much more kind of behind, um, uh, much more behind the scenes, that somebody looks into a palantir and sees Frodo captive in the tower, I think also stays in the published text. Um Mike Drought has talked about this many times, and, and I think that this passage is fairly good evidence uh, to support his reading. Um, uh, Mike Drought has always said that's what he thinks, he, he, he's pretty sure, that's what Denethor sees in his Palantir. That last time that uh, Denethor goes up and uh, uses the Palantir to try to see once after Faramir's been injured, um, the moment when he gives into despair, what, what is it? that leads him to give in to despair. Um, it's that last trip upstairs to use the Palantir. And the timing, the chronology does work out. Frodo is in the Tower of Kirith Ungol at that time. Um, and remember, Gandalf has told him, Denethor, that is, not Frodo, um, about, he knows, like he's received Faramir's report. Um, he knows that what Gandalf has done. He knows about the ring bearer. He looks in the Palantir and sees the ring bearer in the tower of Kirith Ungol, right? Um, sees him captured and, uh, uh, and despairs, right? Believes Sauron has taken the ring, right? Um, and everything is, everything is, and that's what leads him to despair. Um, so that element I think is, um, is, is clearly, uh, another thing which he retains, and we can see that we can see the seeds of it, right? Um, in uh, in this um, in this funny scene of Gandalf chucking the Palantir down. Um, okay, Minas Tirith. We get the description of Minas Tirith. You know, he alluded to the description of Minas Tirith, but it took him a long time to get around to actually writing it. Um, Gandalf and Pippin reach Minas Tirith dawn. Description of Minas Tirith and its huge cyclopean concentric walls. Cyclopean, I believe, in the sense that each one has one gate, right? Like the like the cyclops with one eye, right? Um, so it's got the concentric. So that this con that concept of the uh, the concentric walls, each of which has one gate, which are not lined up, and you've got to go back and forth, right? That's part of the, as you can see in the little drawing uh, of the original concept of Minas Tirith, which is much simpler, right? City on hill with concentric walls going uh, up uh, the hill. It is, in fact, a fort in town the size of a small mountain. It has seven circles with seven, six, five, four, three, two, one gates before the White Tower is reached. Those numbers, I think, correlate to the numbers on the little picture that he's drawn. Uh, you may remember this is the text that's actually are written around the picture uh, that he's drawn on this page. He obviously wrote the picture first and then wrote the text in around it on the page. Um, okay. Uh, right, before the White Tower is reached. They are challenged on the borders of the city land, Pelennor, about which ruins of an old wall ran. Gandalf carries messages from Rohan and speaks some password, and they let him by in wonder. So he rides up to the sixth court and dismounts. There Pippin is re-something or other. They pass into high city Taurost, and so come before Denethor, who at first does not recognize Gandalf. Denethor comes out to his throne, maybe? News. Denethor has lit the beacons because of what his spies tell Faramir Boromir. Thrown empty. Denethor has seat in front. He comes in after Gandalf arrives. He has a secret letter from Faramir telling of Boromir's death and meeting with Frodo, but not overtly mentioning Ring. Okay. Uh, here, I, I think that we're seeing Gan uh, 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 
Tolkien's uh, ideas evolving as he writes here, right? Um, I'm not sure when he says Denethor, who at first does not recognize Gandalf, I wonder if that means literally like Gandalf comes in and he's like, who are you? Like, who's the old dude with the stick? Right. I, I'm not, you know, like I've never seen. Oh, right. Gandalf. Of course. Now I, now I, now I place you. Right. Um, it might be that it might also mean does not recognize Gandalf in another sense. Like that is, doesn't acknowledge his, uh, position, you know, um, does not, uh, you know, recognize Gandalf in the sense of like, uh, you know, the Lord of Minas Tirith recognizes, you know, like that is acknowledges the presence of and the worthiness to speak in his presence, you know, that, that kind of recognition. Um, that is, I don't know if he simply has forgotten who Gandalf is or if he's just dissing him. Um, personally, I would say that he's probably just dissing him here. Um, it is possible, Tony, that he's talking about Gandalf changing too much from gray to white, that Gandalf the white coming in, he doesn't even realize who he is, that he's dealing with somebody entirely new. That is also possible. Um, even if that's it, even if it's just an innocent, like, Oh, it's you Gandalf. I didn't recognize you in the new color. Um, I, even if that's the situation, we do get some clear evidence of tension here now. The, the split between them already began. Denethor wanted to be defensive. Gar uh, Gandalf wanted to fight on the plain. Faramir sided with Gandalf. We already got that, right? Um, that story seems to be now developing a little bit. Um, that last paragraph, right? He comes in after Gandalf. So he leaves Gandalf kicking his heels in the hall and then comes in with a secret letter from Faramir. Uh, telling about Boromir's death and the meeting with Frodo uh, so that he already knows all this stuff and is going to interrogate them about it and everything. So um, yeah, I, I think I, I think that we can see some evidence here of tension, right, between Denethor and Gandalf. The mere, the two of them have different suggestions, you know, tactically for how to, uh, how to handle the battle uh, seems to be growing and developing into something a little bit, a little bit more here. Um, and yeah, Stephen, I don't know if the, if the throne thing, of course, you know, remember this is one of those words that is hard to read and Christopher's guessing at. Um, does this mean that he, uh, thrown empty, Denethor has seat in front. Is that a second thought, right? He's like, no, you know, he, he first says he comes out to his throne and then he's like, no, wait a second, even better. He shouldn't have a throne, right? He's a steward. He should have a little chair uh, and the throne should be empty. I'm not sure. Uh, it would fit for Tolkien to be kind of rethinking that as we go through. Is it possible that the word, the word in that first sentence isn't even thrown? Not really sure there. But, uh, um, I think if I had to guess, it would be, um, I would say that he's not changing his mind, um, that he's rather just sort of clarifying what Denethor's throne actually is and talking about the throne of the king there. Um, but it's possible. I, th I certainly think it's possible that the, that he's changing his mind as he goes through. Okay, well, let's shift up to Rohan for a little bit, and then we'll come back and look at the so that you know this some of those ma so, some of those really important Gondor stories, right? And the Gondor element. Let's now shift and look at uh, the Rohan elements, and then we'll come back, hopefully, running out of time, uh, to how Tolkien puts all these things all together. Um, I want to look at uh, one thread, which is one of my favorite threads from this whole chapter, uh, and that's Dunharrow, and the concept of Dunharrow as it evolves. So let's, let's here's the first shot at it. As Theoden is going back to Dunharrow from Isengard, we get this description. Legend said that here was a dwelling and a holy place of forgotten men in the dark years, before ever the ships came to Belfalas or Gondor was built. 
what had become of them, vanished, gone away, to mingle with the people of Dunland or the folk of Lebenin by the sea. Here the Aorlingas had made a stronghold, but they were not a mountain folk, and as the days grew better when Sauron was far away, they passed down the vale and built Adarus in the north, at the north of Herodale. But ever they kept the hold of Dunharrow as a refuge. There still dwelt some folk reckoned as Rohir, and the same in speech, but dark with gray eyes. The blood of the forgotten men ran in their veins. Okay, so the con- the initial concept of Dunharrow, A, it was the original royal seat of Rohan, right? So when the Rohirrim first arrived, they set up that, because this is, it's always been a defensible place, Dunharrow, right? So um, because it was a stronghold, they made their stronghold here. This was where Aorl the Young set up, right? Then, as things chilled out a little bit, they build Adaras and move out, right? But they and they keep Dun, uh, Harrowdale as a bull hole, right? But the Dunharrow is uh, it has this history as probably a holy place, right? But not much is made of that. The most important thing is that there were these other people there, right? Um, it's 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 connection to the ancient history of of Rohan, right? That's this is where this was the original capital of Aerol the Young, um, but uh, but it's it's there were these men there. But they mingled with them. And we've seen this happen elsewhere. We saw this in Gondor, right? When the Numenorians come in and they're the sort of, you know, the native Gondorians and they all work together until the day comes, of course, when the Gondorians boot the Numenorians out originally. Um, so originally this is just they they get together. That people as a people vanishes, but they have their blood has mingled with the Rohirrim. And so you get these... Uh, uh, these dark, gray-eyed uh, Rohir still living in the hold of Dunharrow, right, or in that general area. Um, so that's it. Pretty simple, right? No problem. And we're going to revisit it. Okay. So at last they came to the hold, the mountain homes of long-forgotten folk. Dim legends only now remembered them. Here they had dwelt and had made a dark temple, a temple and holy place in the dark years. Change to, uh, here they had dwelt in fear under the shadow of the dark years, before ever a ship came to Belfalas or Gondor of the kings was built. That was in the first reign of Sauron the Great, when Barad-dûr first was founded, but they had something or other him and built a refuge or something that no enemy could take. There was a wide upland field, changed a slope, set back into the mountain, the lap of Dunharrow. Arms of the mountain embraced it, except only for a space upon the west. Here the green bay fell over a sheer brink down into Harrowdale. A winding path led up. Behind the sheer walls of the vale were caves made by ancient art. Water fell in a fall over the something or other and flowed somewhere in the midst of something else. When the men of Gondor came there, the men of this place lived for a while, owning no lord of Gondor. But what came of them, no legend knew. They had vanished and gone far away. Okay, so this concept of this older race of people who are no more, right? Not just like a group of indigenous people now kind of integrated into the melting pot of Rohan. Uh, that's that's okay, but that's not really very interesting. This concept of this ancient people who are no more, right? Let's let's work with that, right? And their story becomes a pretty remarkable one, right? So these people, these ancient people, um, they were there before the Numenorians came, right? This is pre-Gondor, before the Numenorians came back, way back during the first reign of Sauron the Great, during the Second Age, after the whole forging of the Ring of Power thing, right? They were there, they were there when Sauron reigned over this whole area before the Numenorians drove him back, before he was captured and taken to the Isle of Numenor by Arpharazan. Um They saw the first reign of Sauron there, and they were not impressed. 
right? They built Dunharrow. They built a refuge that no enemy could take. They seem to have defied Sauron the Great. They didn't serve Sauron, right? They were their own masters. They were not big, right? They were not a major power. They were not, didn't seem to be very populous, but um, they made Dunharrow and uh, uh, and they their refuge here. Um, the arms of the mountain embraced it. I love the anthropomorphic image of this, both the lap and the embrace, right? It's very cozy. Um, and uh, and the caves, right? You know, you've got the cave, and this is this is a it's it's a dark temple. It's a holy place, right? Um, notice his first impulse seems to be to make them ancient, forgotten, and possibly shady, right? He was going to have a dark temple, but then he's like, no, 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 a temple and holy place in the dark years. Maybe they were good guys. Maybe this temple was a temple to Iluvatar or something, right? Who because they're holding out against the shadow. These guys, right? They're like, we've got Dunharrow. We're, we're not bothered with with Sauron. And then the Gondorians come. And they're not bothered with them either, right? They're right there. Okay, they're not that right there in the middle of Gondor, but they're in the northern edges of, of Gondor, and they're like, hey, we didn't bow to Sauron, and we're not bowing to you either, right? Um, I mean, the people of Dunharrow, these ancient lost forgotten people, are kind of cool, actually. Um, uh, but then, but then uh, what came of them, no legend knew. Oh, but wait, it's even cooler. They vanished and went far away. They just left. They didn't die out. No, no. These awesome people who defied everybody and lived in their little... They just... They just Maybe they're still somewhere. Who knows where they are, right? Maybe they'll come back. Who knows? Um, and the sooner the better, I say. Um, I, I... This is really neat, right? So he's really developing this idea of this... Um, um, uh, of this... So notice how this story grew out of essentially two data points, right? One, an ancient forgotten people of whom there is very little current trace lived here. And two, this place, which was the center of their power, is an enormously defensible mountain stronghold, right? Those two things uh, seem to be the two, uh, uh, the two root elements of this really cool and, and rather dramatic story. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, okay. And then what happens? When the Aerolingas came first to Dunharrow, they found only one old man living in a cave, speaking in a strange tongue. None could understand him. Often he spoke and seemed to desire to tell them something, but he died before any could read his words. Where were all the rest of his folk? Who knows, right? So I, we still have this idea of this forgotten, but, but oh, this is, this is a bigger teaser, right? They've left, and maybe they're going to come back. Now we have this, like, I, what is he? He's almost like a tour figure, right? Um, uh, I mean, there's something about this that reminds me of tour in uh, um, Nevrost, right? Anyway, um, this old man who has has stayed to deliver a message which he can't deliver because he stayed so long the language has changed and they can't talk to each other. Um, That's that's kind of remarkable, right? Uh, And of course, you know, I mean, obviously, this is Tolkien, right? So like the whole, uh, you know, language barrier thing this is not that's not a throwaway thing for Tolkien right this is uh, it's part of the mystery right that these ancient what were they trying to warn them of how old was that dude right how long had he been there um, what was the message uh, yeah Stephen says how far did Tolkien get in creating this guy's language that is exactly the right question right this guy because there's no way right Tolkien comes up with that story there's no way he's not doesn't at least he's not at least thinking about it right uh, you know at least he's going to have some kind of basic pattern for this guy's language and some kind of explanation um, of uh, some kind of explanation of uh, uh, why his language was so different from the language of Rohan that they couldn't understand him at all. Um, yeah, 
Yeah, exactly. Um, and C- Carrie Gross, I was thinking of uh, uh, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade here too, with the guy guarding the Holy Grail. Yeah, I was kind of thinking about that also. Um, and I, I, I was thinking about it even more, Carrie, later on. Um, okay, but notice what we didn't have. We didn't have any Pukul men. So, let's add Pukul men. This was the hold of Dunharrow, the work of long forgotten men. No song or legend remembered them, and their name was lost. For what purpose they had made this place, a town or secret temple, or a tomb of hidden kings, no one could say. Here they had dwelt under the shadow of the dark years, before ever ship came to the mouths of Anduin, or Gondor of the kings was built, and now they had vanished, and only the old hawker men, later changed to pukul men with two O's, which is adorable, were left still sitting at the turnings of the road. Okay, so uh, notice it doesn't say that they defied everybody, right? That they defied Sauron and then they defied Gondor. It just talks about their antiquity, right? And now notice it's no longer definitely a uh, temple, right? Um, Which it was... It was definitely a holy place and a temple before. Now, maybe it's a temple, maybe it's not, maybe it's just a town. Who who really knows, right? So, some of the the kind of sacred mystery of this place is it's at least being cast into into doubt. And yes, that's that's the dark years, uh, exactly. Uh, um, yeah. So, Mike, it's just lost for depth. I do think that that's what's one of the things that's happening here. Again, we see this trend, right? Tolkien goes into great detail at first, and then as he revises, he tells us less and less. Um, I like to think that they're still defying both Sauron and Gondor here, like they were in the older story, uh, in, in the previous version, I should say. Um, but he's just not telling us explicitly anymore that they are. But notice the new, the, the really new element here, besides the saying less and the active uncertainty about what the function of it was. The other element, the new element that gets added here is the, the, the hawker, hawker men, right? The pukul men, eventually. Um, and that is specifically hawker, or H-O-K-E-R, um, uh, uh, whichever, uh, whichever it is that that the 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 Hulker men. That's a a name of mockery, specifically, right? He's he's mock the the ro- the name that the Rohirrim gave this statue. Make fun of them for their ugliness, right? Um, so we get the attitude. We weren't told that the Rohirrim had any such attitude to these men before, before they were like mingling with them. Right. Um, you know, and we had all these dark haired, gray eyed Rohirrim in this area. Um, but, um, but anyway, here we get, um, the, the, the addition of this new element that the Rohirrim looked down on them, these ancient people, right? They don't understand them. All that's left are these statues and the statues are ugly. And so they make up a derisive name for them, right? Um, that was another th- oh, yeah, the other thing I wanted to make sure to, to emphasize, to make sure that we don't miss, um, Dunharrow, right? Caves in the mountains, right? They're caves in the mountains from the very beginning, right? So we go, we go up the windy path and we go into the, the lap up there and there are caves in there. Um, what's in the caves? Uh, let me ask this question in another way. In the earlier versions now, in these early versions of the Dunharrow story, for what purpose do you go into the caves under the mountain? What's their function? Do you remember? What's their function? Why do you go into the caves? If you're if if you're if you're a man of Rohan, why do you go in? If you're Theoden. Anybody remember? Jennifer, yeah, feasting. It's 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 the party hall. Yeah, it's the party hall. Um, they are there for refuge, right? I mean, so that, I mean that that is certainly true. Like in times of war, you can retreat there, but that's where they have the feast. 
Uh, the feast, the great feast of celebration of the victory of Theoden and, and the funeral ale of, of, of Hama, right, um, happens there, right? We're having a, we throw a big party in the caves of Dunharrow, right? Um, that's where all of the celebration occurs, right? It's a party cave until it's not a party cave anymore, right? Uh, and remember, it's not just like mentioned offhand that it's a party cave. Like, the party cave element was a major part of the of the primary story. This is just setting up the party cave business. So, like, the, this is the setting of we're going here, we're going into the caves, and we're having music and light and laughter and uh, shenanigans at the party, the feasting that's happening inside these caves. Okay. Um, at the last, the king's company came to a... a sh well, I think this is a, a mistake here. I'm not sure. A sharp uh, turning, perhaps. Uh, and the road passed between the walls of rock and led out into a wide upland. The Furienfeld, men called it. A green mountain field of grass and heath high above the sheer wall of the valley. Beyond it was a dark wood that climbed steeply on the sides of a great round hill. Its bare black head rose above the trees far above, and on it stood a single pinnacle of ruined stone. Two long lines of unshaped stones marched from the brink of the cliff towards it and vanished in the gloom of the trees. Those who followed that road came in the sighing darkness of the Furian Holt to a huge doorway in the side of the black hill of Furian. Signs and figures were above it, worn by time that none could read. Within were vast caverns, so men said, though in living memory none had ever dared to enter. Such was the dark Dunharrow, the work of long-forgotten men. All right. Um, so, uh, oh yeah, Brink. That's probably it, Mike. Brink, yeah, I think. Brink. Um, uh Brink. And by the way, can I just say, I take personal responsibility uh, for any typographical errors uh, in tonight's slides. Uh, as you will notice, there's an enormous number of slides. And not only are there an enormous number of for those of you who don't know, I don't even type my own slides. I would never be able to get through all of this uh, 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 prep as in addition to doing all the other things that I'm doing, if I didn't have wonderful help from my team, uh, big shout out to uh, uh, everybody who helps on both ends of production. Um, uh, Lynn does such a wonderful job typing and, and is so patient with me. Um, I sent her like 26 long slides like hours ago, basically, you know, preparing this at the last minute. Um, so, uh, she had to type all these up in a big, huge hurry, and it's which is totally my fault, and did a way better job than I would have done myself. Um, uh, anyway, so yeah, if if there if there are typos, it is totally my fault because I didn't leave her any time to proofread at all. Um, anyway, okay, so Brink, I think I, I think it is Brink there. Okay, notice now, Dunharrow is dark again. Remember, it was dark at the very... Like, he briefly thought of making it a dark temple, right? It was going to be an eerie, sinister place. And then he's like, nah, it's a holy it's a holy place, right? These people were awesome. It's a place of, of ancient awesomeness who had some kind of message for us. And this old guy, who, I don't, who knows what would have happened had he been able to communicate his message from the awesome people of old who have departed and might come back someday or something. Who knows, right? You know... Now he changes the story again, right? The caves are not the refuge. They're not the feasting hall anymore. Now the caves are dark, right? The mountain is dark. The forest is dark and sighing. Uh, the, there's a door in the side of the mountain, and it's really scary, and nobody dares to go in, and nobody knows what it's about. Least of all Tolkien, he has no idea, right, uh, what is in the mountain. It's a mystery, right? A mystery to everybody, including, I think, fairly clearly, the author. Um, it is not necessarily full of dead people. We're still not anywhere close. We're getting closer to the Oathbreakers, right? Um, now this door in the... Uh, 
you know, this door in the uh, in the mountainside is there's something dark, sinister and scary about it. And it's the work of those long forgotten men. So now the long forgotten men are getting I don't know if they're getting, you know, shady, but uh, there's something there's some deep mystery here. Um, yeah. But wait, there's more. The Firian, Firgen, added, or the Halafirian, is a hill surrounded by a dark pine wood, the Firian Holt. It is, it is, in it is a great cave, the Dunharrow. No one has ever been in the cave. Nobody's ever been in there. It is said to be a Haliern and to contain some ancient relic of old days before the dark something. It is 22 miles up Harrowdale from Edoras. I love it when Tolkien does his little... Like, <laughs> that, that kind of, that seems really jarring, right? Deep, dark, mysterious, and there's some relic in there, and who knows what it is. And it's 22 miles away exactly, uh, a Perodel from Edoras, uh, because, of course, he's trying to work out all the details as he goes, and so this stuff pops out. Um, so, Carrie, there's a relic in there, right? Now I was totally thinking of Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. Um, so notice, he doesn't have any idea what's in there. Right. But here's his first guess. So first he, he realized that it wasn't a happy place. It was a, an ominous place. It's a scary place. Uh, and there's a deeply mysterious door. And. But so, OK, so no one's ever been in there before, but there's got to be something special here. Right. There's got to be something important. Maybe maybe there's an ancient relic of old days. So maybe there's something in there that needs to be found and recovered. Is somebody going to go in? Are we going to do, we're going to get Indiana Jones going to go in, right? Is Aragorn going to go in and recover a relic, right? From the ancient people? Who knows? Right? In these enlightened days, of course, no one believes a word of it, says Mike Moore. Exactly. Um, yeah. So, hey, I have no idea what is in the Dunharrow. Um, uh, but, uh, and of course that's not the direction that we're going to go. But again, notice, I love how we can see that the kind of story that this is, is changing and changing. Right. Um, but one of the things that is one of the other kind of threads of this change or sort of trajectories of the change of this story here, um, is not just that like the mystery of the ancient people of Dunharrow is getting kind of darker and spookier, but also that it is becoming relevant to the story. It wasn't before, right? Before it was just like local color, right? And we're describing the setting and, oh, there used to be some ancient people here and it's kind of mysterious and they're creepy statues and they're kind of ugly. But anyway, on to the party cave, right? I mean, you know, that's, that's how it was. And then we have the feast and then we're going, we're riding off to Gondor and we're done, right? Um, the fact that we have a scary door that no one has ever entered kind of sounds like somebody needs to enter that, doesn't it? Um, but why would they do that? That would be stupid, right? Who would go through this scary door that nobody ever entered before? For what reason? Well, there's got to be a reason, right? Maybe there's some kind of ancient relic in there, though. Who knows what it is? This sounds like we're setting up a reason why somebody's going to go in there, right? So and I don't know. We don't know yet what's coming there. Um, but we can see that beginning to grow. And so I, that seems to me another very natural way in which this story is growing. The story of the, the people of Dunharrow um, has kind of come to a point where Tolkien can't just let it go as background, right? Now it needs to be worked into the plot. Okay. So the feast, we're in the party, the party cave, right? Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Kate says places like words must have meaning. Yeah, very much. OK. The torchlit stone hall. Party cave. Right. Mary sat beside Theoden as was promised. Eowyn brings in the cup for the drinking. Even as Theoden drains it, the messenger comes. Aragorn had already arrived and greets King Theoden side by side with Eowyn. Aragorn's there first. So Aragorn and Theoden separate on the road, and Aragorn rides openly across the plain while Theoden uh, goes with his main host by mountain paths, and Aragorn gets there sooner. But he's just, he gets there sooner and just hangs out, right? 
So he and Eowyn are hanging out. I think platonically. Uh, remember that uh, Aragorn and Eowyn were into each other, right, at the beginning. And he had some plans, right? Uh, Tolkien had some plans vis-a-vis -vis Eowyn and Aragorn, right? Uh, there were wedding bells in their future, but he seems already to have rejected the idea of them getting married and of having a, uh, a requited love, as Christopher says, between the two of them. And he's decided uh, to kill her off instead. Um... <laughs> yeah, Kate says she must say she laughs at the number of times Eowyn brought in wine. Yeah, I think it's just the recurrence of that image. Like, it just shows you how much he wanted to use that image, right? He wanted, he's like, he wanted Eowyn to do the full whale theow really, really badly. So every time he describes the scene, he's like, and by the way, Eowyn is totally bringing in the wine, right? You know, she's going to do her Anglo Saxon. Her Anglo Saxon. He's gonna do her. She's gonna do her Wealthyow thing. Uh, that's the uh, Hrothgar's wife in Beowulf. Um, uh, but anyway, yeah, he is. He is insistent on that. Uh, 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 Kate, I agree. That is as unwavering. Um, and of course, that that sticks. So anyway, so here, but here's Aragorn hanging out platonically with Eowyn. Um, and uh, greeting Theoda when he arrives. Halbered, sister son of Denethor. He asks for 10,000 spears at once. Men are gathering in the east beyond the inland sea of Nurnan and far north. Eventually, they may assail the east Emnet, but that would not come yet. Now, orcs have passed south through Nargil Pass in the southland beyond the river Harnan. Don't worry about the names and geography. At least I'm not going to worry about them just now. Um, but... Um, one thing that really struck me in reading this, and I, once I was noticing this, I can't believe I didn't notice this before. Um, this is an interrupted feast, right? You, you, um, do you see the reference he's making here by having the messengers from Gondor come in and interrupt the celebratory feast and bring the message that then makes... Theoden and his captains leap to arm and to arms and go marching off against the foe. John, it's very Arthurian, right? Um, in fact, it's it recalls very closely a very famous occasion. Um, there are several times in which we get, you know, Ar Arthur's knights all feasting, and then somebody. In fact, it's like a feature. In fact. They won't even eat until this happens, right? It's, it's almost like in the Arthurian tradition. They get so sick of their feasts getting interrupted that Arthur passes a rule saying no one's allowed to eat anything until a marvel happens, right? Because it's a given that a marvel is going to happen at every single feast, right? So let's not even start eating. We're just going to wait until somebody comes. Oh, okay, somebody came in, right? Green dude with a talking head, right? Came, okay, we can eat now. Right. We're all good. Um, so, yeah, that's exactly that 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 happens a lot. But no, the specific interrupted feast uh, that I think Tolkien is thinking of here uh, is the one that happens at the beginning at the beginning of the Middle English alliterative uh, Mort Arthur. Um, that is King Arthur and his company are feasting and then emissaries from Rome come in and they uh, they come in and they're like, you know, we defy you and we insist that you pay us uh, tribute that's due. And then Arthur's like, what? We won't have that. And his knights stand up and are like, no, we won't have that either. So they all get up and they march off and they go and they conquer Rome. Um, this is, uh, you know, this is where the, the fall of Arthur begins. Um, he begins his own Arthurian story at this moment of the interrupted feast. Of course, the circumstances are different, right? This is not, um, you know, Theoden leading his uh, uh, knights out into battle is not like King Arthur, who is going to uh, subdue a rival, right? 
it's not like that. Um, he's changed the the dynamics of it, um, but it still it still has the flavor, right? It still has that Arthurian flavor, uh, which I think is uh, which I think is fun. Um, Halbered, who's been upgraded from horse to Gondorian messenger, uh, not yet received his full upgrade uh, to uh, Numenorian ranger, um, but. Um, Anyway, he's uh, uh, he and he's Denethor's. He's related to him. He's Denethor's sister's son, uh, so that's interesting. Um, okay, let's keep going. The innovation of Mary's perspective, right? He's described the scene and the arrival at Dunharrow a lot of times already, and then he decides to really focus in on Mary's perspective. They ride on. Mary looked about him. He was tired, for he was riding himself now, on a sturdy hill pony furnished for him at Helm's Deep, but he had enjoyed the journey among the passes and high dales, the tall pine woods, and the bright waterfalls. He loved mountains, and the desire to see and know them had moved him very had moved him strongly when he and his friends had plotted to go with Frodo, far away in the Shire. He rode with the king's company, and often he had uh, jogged along beside Theoden himself, telling him of the Shire uh, and the doings of hobbit folk. They had got on well together, although much of, much of Mary's language was hard for Theoden to understand. But all the same, and in spite of the honor, he was lonely, especially at the day's end. Aragorn had ridden on far ahead with the swifter riders, taking Legolas and Gimli, and he missed Pippin deeply. The fellowship seemed now altogether scattered. Okay, um, so here we have the same scenes, right? The same scenery, the same scenes now being introduced in a completely different way, right? Deciding to, and again, it's to me, it's almost like the way in which uh, Tolkien like starts off and like working out all the details in the narrative itself, and then pulling back from those and leaving more and more of it unsaid, um, shifting the register from uh, you know the narrator telling us all about everything to Mary and his point of view, and this very Shire oriented, even recalling Mary back in the Shire, um, is. Uh, um, it grounds us in a different way. It invites us to look at this in a different way. Um, it gives us an element of wonder which is not only, I think, much greater than the narrator is able to convey, but also of a different quality. Um, and, yeah, this is a great passage, Kate. I really loved this, too. Um, uh, and I love that, uh, you know, he he totally wanted to go with Frodo, but part of why he was plotting is that he really wanted to see stuff just like this, right? Okay. Now, back to the Allies gathering business. Okay, so Aragorn and Eowyn met the king. We're doing again the, the you know, the, their arrival in Harrowdale. They say that riders are mustering at Dunharrow. Gandalf's command, he had already passed by Idara some days ago. Many have already come in, and many strange folk. I do not something understand how, but a summons went forth long ago. Long ago. Rangers have come, and Dunlanders, and messengers from Woodmen of Mirkwood. They say that but for the shadow of the new war they would make a feast of victory. Even so, they will feast and rejoice because of the king's return. Torchlit Stone Hall. Party cave. Mary sat beside Theoden as promised. Okay. Um. So... The news. This is the news that Aragorn has to give to the king, um, and that the muster is being joined by other people, right? Rangers, Dunlanders, and Woodmen of Mirkwood is really fascinating. Notice how he is making the riding of the Rohirrim now part of this larger kind of almost predestined structure. Some summons went forth long ago. Did Gandalf send it? Right? Who sent it? Who uh, um, invited all these people? Right? This sort of all star team of the region who has come down to join together. And notice also 
the thing which is to me most fascinating and honestly I miss it I wish he'd kept it uh, in the published text or that it could somehow be incorporated I love the fact that dumb lendings have shown up right like we're going to bury the hatchet with the dumb lendings we've done the Helm's Deep thing right and that was you know that was a um, I was suggesting before that there seemed to be some you know when we were looking at Helm's Deep there seemed to be some kind of ambivalence about the dumb lendings right um having some of them come in and join the Rohirrim because at the end of the day, any issues that they've had with the Rohirrim are less important than the issues that they have with the encroaching shadow of Sauron, right? Uh, so they're going to come. Woodmen are going to come down from Mirkwood because, again, you got to help, right? And rangers have come down. They've come from really far away, so the message must have gone up a long time ago uh, in order to bring them down. Um... So, again, the Rite of the Rohirrim is not just going to be about Rohan coming and redeeming the Oath of Aeoral. Uh, this, is, this is... They are part of a larger strategy, right? Um, and we don't even know who is behind it, who sent the summons. This is... A, a later version, from a later version. Theoden replies that that is more than he could have mustered, That so 10,000 spears are demanded, right? Uh, Theoden replies that that is more than he could have mustered in a something or other, penciled word was illegible, at his height and before the war with Saruman. Eowyn says that women must ride now, as they did in a like evil time in the days of Brego, son of Mark showing name omitted, Aeoral son. Uh, good old Mark showing name omitted. Uh, when the wild men of the east came from the inland sea into the eastern net. Pencil text struck through and not overwritten. Theoden decides to pass over the something or other rough or scr struck out the Skada pass to the Vale of Blackroot into Lebenin and fall on enemy in the rear. Ink over pencil. Aragorn in margin. Aemir begs leave to take a force over the Skada Pass and fall in the enemy's rear. I will go with you in my brother's stead, said Eowyn, added to King Theoden. Okay. All right. So we have this sort of working out. So step one. Step one, Theoden says, we don't have enough people. You need 10,000 spears? I don't have 10,000 spears, right? Are you kidding me? And Eowyn's like, hey, no problem. Women, right? The shield maidens will ride, Jennifer, exactly. Okay, no problem. We can supplement our normal spear complement with shield maidens, right? No problem. Uh, so Eowyn has the, has the solution to the personnel problem. Now we have the travel tactics, right? First thought, Theoden is going to go over the passes, right? He's going to go over the Skata Pass into Lebenin, and he's going to attack from behind, right? That would be even cooler. But then, wait, no, hang on. No, Theoden's going to go around the normal way, but somebody needs to go over the pass and come around from behind, right? So Aragorn, unless it's Aemir, is going to go over the Skata Pass and fall in the enemy's rear, right? And you can see why he wanted Aemir to do it. Like, Aragorn is a logical candidate to go over the pass and attack people in Lebenin. But it'd be kind of cooler to have Aemir do it, because then Eowyn can say, I will go with you in my brother's stead, right? So Eowyn is going to be at the lead of the shield maidens who are going to ride with the king to make the 10,000 spears, and that will enable her to die in the Battle of Pelennor Field after killing the Witch King like she's supposed to do, right? So, okay. So maybe Aragorn is going to go over the pass into the Blackroot Vale, and maybe he's not. Um, the summons. Watch how the summons is evolving. Many have already come, and with them many strange folk not of Rohan. For in some manner the rumor of war has long been abroad, and men from far away say that they have had summons. Uh, a world that all, uh, that all who hate Mordor should come to... Ed uh, a word. A word that all who hate Mordor should come to Edoras or to Minas Tirith. There are Dunlanders here, and some even of the woodmen from the borders of Mirkwood, and wandering folk of the Empty Lands, and even some of the rangers of the north, last remnant of Elendil's race, my own folk, they have come seeking me. 
Okay, so the Rangers were just one of a catalog before, right? Oh, we got a bunch of, we got some Dunlendings over here. We got some Woodmen over there. We got some Rangers over there, right? We're just all the people that we know of from up north, they're coming down, right? All these other people that we've heard of either a long time ago or recently, a long time ago, like the Rangers, recently like the Dunlendings, they're going to come in and join so that we have a, you know, we have, a, you know, an all-star team of all of the people, you know, who want to oppose the shadow. That's great. Um, OK, but wait, hang on. There's, there's, there's another. This is not we're not going to have a bunch of random Rangers. Right. If the Rangers have come all the way from, you know, up around the greater Bree area. Right. There's got to be a reason for that. There's got to be a story behind that, right? They've got to, they, they, they can't just wander down. So um, they've come seeking me. So the, the fact that Aragorn makes a big deal of this um, is important, right? You know, they, they um, uh, before, again, he didn't make a big deal of it before. Now he, re now, you know, now it's like, okay. The coming down of the Rangers is a bigger deal. And you'll notice uh, as we move forward, in the end, they're going to become such a big deal that they displace everybody else instead of having an all-star team being gathered. It's just going to be the Rangers, right? The Rangers coming on their particular mission. And the only message that is sent out is going to be the message um, to the Dunedain, right? Summoning them to come down to their chieftain. Michelle, it is interesting that the Brelanders are notable from their absence from the list. Um, I mean, maybe they're just not warlike enough. We know the Dunlendings are warlike. You know, to many of the Rohirrim know that to their cost. Um, we know that the Woodmen of Mer Mirkwood are fierce, right? Bjornings, you know, can hold their own. The Brelanders not going to be much use, right? Are they seriously? What, what are they going to, what, is Butterbur going to lead them down? Like, nah, I don't think so. But, uh, um, uh, I know Stephen Barlaman wouldn't leave Bree for any money, right? So, so I doubt that that's going to happen. But Michelle, I agree, it is interesting that they're not included here. Are they too domestic? Right? Is that the problem? I don't know. Um, okay. More evil counsels for evil days. By the way, I have no idea what that's talking about there. Evil counsels for evil days. That sounds to me like. One of those lines that occurred to Tolkien in the middle of his outline or at the beginning of his outline, he just jots it down like somebody was going to say that somewhere, uh, but I don't know who or exactly where or what it's talking about. But anyway, evil counsels for evil days. Amir rides away and the king laments. So Amir is leading the troop over the Skata Pass in order to uh, hit the enemy from behind so that Eowyn can take his place by the king's side. That's great. And the king laments. Oh, so the king is lamenting like Amir is already dead. He's He thinks, you know, for the snow is still deep and the wind over the Skata has been the death of many a man. So, oh man, he might just die of exposure. Like, so this is a really risky journey that he's making over the pass. And of course, this makes perfect sense of why Theoden's entire army doesn't go that way, right? Um, so, okay, that makes sense. Now it is to be told that King Theoden rested a day on Dunher in Dunharrow and rode then to Edoras and passed thence with 5,000 riders fully armed and horsed and took the road to Minas Tirith. Others were to follow. In five days they came within the sight of Minas Tirith, which may or may not be February 15th, Mary's first sight of Minas Tirith from afar, the plain below the hill covered with camps. It would be better geographically if the main attack were made to come from the direction of Kirith Ungol and the Swerting's only a di diversion which nearly turns the scale. Muster in Minas Tirith. Okay, so notice, I think, the things that are shifting in this outline, right? We still have, we've, so we've decided on Aemir. Is, is it going to be Aragorn? Is it going to be Aemir that leads the, the army over the pass, the small subset of the army over the pass to attack them from behind? It's going to be Aemir. Aemir has won that, and now we're just worried that he's going to die, of, you know, he's going to get frostbite and stuff. Uh, it's going to be terrible. Um, but notice the other things that are shifting. Um, the main attack is coming from Kirith Ungol, so no longer are the Swertings, are the, the, the Harid Wife, um, that's not the, the main threat anymore. The main attack is coming from Kirith Ungol. It's coming from Minas Morgul. And so, now we're still going to get Swertings. We're still going to get the armies coming up from the south, but they're just, they're just a diversion. 
right? Nero returns the scale, right? So they're going to come in and, and try. So now we have the main army from Minas Morgul attacking Minas Tirith, and then the Southrons coming up. And if they make it up, they're going to overwhelm them, right? So that so they're now trying to take the enemy from behind, right? Coming up from the south. But then they, in turn, are going to be taken from behind, hopefully by Amir and his boys, right? Going up, I assume it's the boys. The girls are riding with uh, Theoden. Um, and the musters in Minas Tirith, again, I think this is where we're shifting. Instead of having Dunlendings and, and uh, Woodmen and everybody showing up, at Edoras, we're going to have them showing up at Minas Tirith. So this is, I think, where we're now getting... Uh, and the earlier passage that we read would then come in here, where we're seeing that shifting. Even the rangers showing up, we're seeing that shifting to Minas Tirith. Okay. I've run out of my time, so I'm going to stop here. We just got to where he's mapping it out chapter by chapter. Only have actually a couple slides left. I got through more than 20 slides tonight. I'm kind of proud of that. Um... We'll stop here. Uh, he does. He's he, so he's he's developed some of his Ro, Rohan ideas. He's developed some of his Gondor ideas. Um, he's figured out Dunharrow in that really intriguing story. Notice everything that he still hasn't figured out. We don't have any Oathbreakers. There's no Paths of the Dead. Aragorn is not even going with the army yet. Right? He's still going to be in Gondor, leading the sorties and stuff, apparently, right? Um, we don't have any madness of Denethor, right? Nobody's burning anybody on a funeral pyre. Faramir doesn't even seem to be injured. He's just supporting Gandalf, right? Um, so, you know, all these things which are going to be... And we don't get... We don't have any woodmen, right? We don't have any Han Buri Han. Um... So, okay, so all of those, so we've developed, he's developed all these stories, but we're still way far away from where the stories are ultimately going to get. At the beginning of next time, we will look at his, a few attempts he's making to kind of put it together, right? What is the whole outline going to look like? Um, how is the story going to develop? Um, how are we going to put all that together into this culminating book five, which is totally going to be the end of The Lord of the Rings? Um, okay, great. So let's, um, we'll return to that next week. I will be here next week. Yes, I will. So thanks everybody for joining me tonight. I will see you guys next week as we'll finish this up. Uh, and then we will continue moving forward. Thanks everybody. Good night. The Mythgard Academy has been offering in-depth discussions of awesome books and films since 2013, completely free to attend and free to download. If you've enjoyed our discussions and would like to help them continue, please consider donating at Signum University.